Let's start with a question. When you encounter another human being, what is it that you're encountering? Is an encounter with another human different from an encounter with an AI chatbot? Why? Already, we are hearing stories about people who have fallen in love with their AI chatbot and are grieving the loss of that relationship. Is it different from an encounter with a mouse or a goldfish or your pet dog or a chimpanzee in the zoo? Some of whom might have much better personalities than the people you live with. <laughs> now, intuitively, we think it probably is different, but is there a metaphysical underpinning? That is to say, is there an underpinning in reality for that belief? Is it grounded in reality, or is it just a free-floating intuition that might be wrong? When I was a kid, I don't know how, quite how old I was, I was a weird kid in lots of ways. One of my weirdnesses was, at about the age of eight or nine, I decided to conduct an experiment at school where I would pretend that my teachers and my classmates were robots. This is very, very believable. And after a couple of days, I frightened myself so much because I no longer knew whether they were or not. And then I started to think, well, if, if they are, maybe I am too. So might it be wrong? Might it, is it just a set of preferences? Yeah, humans are more valuable that really bear no real relationship to reality. Here's another set of questions. How do you know if someone's life is worth living or no longer worth living? How should we as a society decide whose life has value? Can we know, can we know, rather than just hope, that all human lives are equally valuable? Or are some lives actually less valuable than others? Are all human lives equally worth protecting and preserving? And if they're not, how do we know when someone's life is not valuable enough to protect and preserve? What value should we as a society and we as individuals ascribe to the life of an unborn child? Or a newly born child who is no less dependent on its mother and father for everything? Does it make a difference if the parents don't want the child? What about the life of someone who is old and frail or terminally ill? Does it make a difference if they don't want to carry on living? If they feel that they are a burden to others or life is just too painful and difficult. More personally, what about you? I'm conscious this could be intensely, painfully personal for some of us. Is your life worth living? What are you worth? What do you do when you reach the point when it feels like your own life is no longer worth living? Now, my aim in this seminar is not to address directly questions of the beginning and end of life, abortion, assisted suicide, questions about intense suffering, uh, social and economic inequalities, global uh, inequalities. I'm actually aiming to be more ambitious than that. <laughs> um, I'm aiming to provide what I'm going to call a deep metaphysical grounding. Now, if you want to impress your friends later, or if you want them just to think you're really weird, or the speaker's really weird, tell them you've been to a seminar on metaphysics and see how they react. What I mean by that is just a consideration of the fundamental nature of reality. I didn't always uh, sort of be a lecturer for a living, so I do know how to talk to real people. I used to be a minister, and I just used to say to my congregation, there's such a thing as reality, and it's really real. Francis Schaeffer, back in the 70s and 80s, was talking about true truth. Well, I think we're at the stage now where we have to talk about real reality, which is absurd, but that's where we are. What is reality? And how does that provide solid ground for belief that all human life is unimaginably precious? And every human life has indescribable dignity. Okay, we're going to start with the doctrine of creation. I wonder if we could have the first slide. 
uh, and we're going to start with the fact that we are creatures. Now, I've got a ton of stuff to get through in our time, and the good stuff is at the end. So I'm afraid you're going to have to buckle in for a while. We need to do this stuff to get to the really good stuff, I think. But we are creatures. Now, this is good, um, but it's not quite as exciting. In the beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1, God created. That's where the Bible starts with creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And actually, viewed as a whole, the Bible doesn't start with creation. Viewed as a whole, the Bible starts before creation and outside of creation with God himself. Who is the God who created? Well, you get hints of it in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. Uh, you get another hint of it in Genesis 1. Uh, it says 127, I think it should be 126. God said, let us create humans in our image. So you're getting a hint right in the ve- on the very first page, in almost the very first verse of the Bible, of, of what later becomes obvious when the Lord Jesus comes to earth, the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not just one God, yes, absolutely one God and one God alone, but one God who exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so where do we start as we think about the doctrine of creation? Well, we start with the creator, and John in his gospel tells us where to start. He's almost like, you know what, you've read in your Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, you're starting not quite far enough back. Let's take a step further back. In the beginning, before there was anything like a creation, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were created by him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life then floods forward uh, and outward to be the life of human beings in creation. So in the beginning, you have God, the God of life, who creates. So what is the first thing we need to know about ourselves? We need to know that we can't begin to think rightly about ourselves without reference to the God who made us. We will always end up in the wrong place because we're starting from the wrong place. We can learn true things about human beings without thinking about God the creator, but they'll be superficial and muddled and confused. So the first thing to know about what it means to be a human being is to know that you're a creature. Not the creator of yourself, of the world around you, of your career, of your family, of your children. You are a creature. And to be a creature means to be be created from nothing. Or ex nihilo, as the, uh, the Latin phrase is. And we just need to contrast that with human creativity for a minute because it's impossible, I think, actually for us to understand what we mean when we say we're created from nothing. Because as soon as I say the word nothing, I have said something. And as soon as you think about, oh, I wonder what nothing is, you're thinking about something. And we are used to creation in all kinds of ways. But we are not used to creation from nothing. No human creativity is ex nihilo, from nothing. You think about a dancer. Where does that come from? It comes from her body, her response to the music and the rhythm, her knowledge of how her particular style of dancing works. You think about a writer sitting down to write. What is it that makes a good writer... Lots of reading. Parents who spoke to that writer as a baby so that the writer begins to, or the future writer begins to learn language. Teachers who teach you how to write. Stories that you've read, people that you've met, so that you begin to be able to construct an imaginative world out of the raw data of the experience of life and the things that you've learned. Think about a sculptor. 
creating a, a beautiful sculpture, not out of nothing, but out of the, 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 the wood or the marble or whatever it is that, that is in front of them. Human creativity is always taking something that exists and reshaping it for something new and hopefully beautiful. That is not how God created the world. There was no pre-existing eternal matter alongside of God, apart from God. So in the words of, you know, I've just finished a PhD on a theologian called John Webster, and that means that you, I will quote John Webster at you uh, till the cows come home, because it's all I've been reading for years. And so he will just flood out. And, and Webster says, nothing is not a strange kind of something. It's the absolute absence of anything. And Genesis 1 verse 1 doesn't quite teach us creation out of nothing. I think it sort of hints at it because it says the first thing that happens is God creates. But how does he create? Well, Hebrews 11, and I'm just going to assume that either you're happy to listen to me read Bible verses or you're going to turn. I think it's very healthy for us to be flipping through our Bibles and <coughs> we don't have time for me to wait, I'm afraid, for you to find things in the Bible. But it's a good exercise. It'll keep you moving and, and awake. Hebrews 11 verse 2, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, just like in Genesis 1, so that what, uh, sorry this is verse 3, what was, uh, so that which was seen was not made out of what was visible. In other words, there was nothing there that God just sort of scooped up and said, let me form this into a world, let me form some galaxies out of this stuff that's already there in a different form. There is nothing there and God brings Everything into existence from nothing. Isaiah 44 and verse 24. God says this about himself. He's contrasting himself to the idols who are created. And the idols are not created out of nothing by humans. They, you get lumps of wood and you carve them and you use the rest of it to make a fire, to burn your sacrifice and eat your food. God is not created, he's the creator, and this is how he created. This is what the Lord says, your redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who alone, that word's missing in the NIV, but it's there in other translations, who alone stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. God says to Job, doesn't he, where were you? When I laid the foundations of the world. Answer, not there. Where were the angels? We mustn't think when God says, let us make man in our image, he's having a conversation with the angels and saying, guys, I need your help here. This is a tricky bit of the creation. Can you come to my assistance? No. I, the Lord, created all things alone by myself. There was nothing there. <laughs> and then God spoke. And however you think it happened, whatever process you think uh, it underwent, at one instant there was nothing at all except God. And then there was a creation. And so in the words of uh, the medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas, God alone is the all-embracing cause of all existence. Let's think about the implications of that for a moment. Crucially, uh, most fundamentally, we don't create ourselves. Uh, if we think that human life and human existence is a project to be undertaken by me, so that I have to shape and form my life, and I am free to do it in whatever I, way I see fit. If the purpose of life is to form and fashion myself and my identity according to my purposes and my plans, then I'm completely wrong. And I have fundamentally misunderstood who I am. We are not creators. We are creatures. We do not create ourselves. And that's actually really good news. Because what it means is, is your existence, the very fact that you are here, is an extraordinary gift. It's not something you have to achieve. 
it's not just the result of the decision of your parents. You are here because God wants you to be here. He doesn't need you. There's no ultimate sort of reason why you absolutely have to exist as you. And yet in his love and generosity, God quite likes the idea of you. And so your existence is pure gift, pure generosity. We will not understand ourselves if we do not know God. Because we won't understand that we are gifts. And it's not just that you are a gift, but the person sitting next to you is a gift too. God's gift to the rest of us. And strikingly to himself and his son, as we'll think about in a bit. We won't understand ourselves if we don't realise that the God who does not need us made us anyway because he loves us. And then, because we are not our own makers, we don't get to define what is the shape of a good and authentic and fulfilled and flourishing human life. God does that. And Romans 11, verse 36, I this is, I just think this is such an important verse just to get nailed down in our minds. The shape, the purpose, the goal, the dignity of human life is defined by our creator. What is the shape of a human life? It's the same as the shape of all existence, which is this. For from him and through him and to him or for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You exist from God. You exist through God because he continues to sustain and uphold and enable your existence and to govern your life. And you exist to or for God. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And to reject that, to reject God's shape, purpose and goal for our lives is to attempt our own unmaking. It's not just a mistake, it's a profoundly destructive mistake. Think about the fish swimming in the river who doesn't like the shape of his life. And he feels a bit, it's a bit restrictive living in this river. I've seen it all, you know, I've swum up and down it a bit now, I'm a bit bored. I'd like to try something different. It looks nice and sunny out there. I'm going to make a bid for freedom. I'm going to set myself free and set a new trajectory for my life. And so with a mighty leap, the fish leaps out of the river and onto the riverbank. Freedom! For what? In the immortal words of Jack D, freedom to do 60 sit-ups and then die. The fish will flounder on the riverbank for a moment. But in attempting to make a new life for itself, it has unmade itself because it is no longer living in the environment in which it lives and moves and has its being. Okay, let's move on. Uh, point two, as creatures, we are needy and dependent. What are we without God? Literally, nothing. That's, that's the meaning of the doctrine of creation out of nothing. That without God, without his prior decision and activity, we are nothing. And so we are needy and dependent. And we need to contrast ourselves with God for a moment. Because God is not like us. God has life in and of himself. Exodus 3.14, God says to Moses... Or well, Moses says to God, rather, in, in verse 13, tell, us, tell me your name. If I'm going to go to the Israelites and, and this cockamamie scheme of yours, God, where I have to go to Pharaoh as well, and uh, at least tell, let me tell them who sent me. And God says, I am who I am. That's my name. That's who you're. I am who I am. Uh, Revelation 1 verse 8 expands that. The Lord is the one who was and who is and who is to come. The Alpha and the Omega the Almighty, the beginning and the end, the one who always exists, the one who doesn't depend on anything, doesn't need anything, isn't changed by anything, 
because he just is who he is. It would be a weird thing, isn't it? Matthew, before we introduce this seminar, just tell us a little bit about yourself. I am who I am. (laughs) Send for the doctor. Although Jesus does that, doesn't he? Before Abraham was, I am. I am just existence existing. John 1 verse 4, in him was life. Capital L, life, I think. And the life was the light of men. Jesus says, let's just turn to John 5, 26 for a minute. Jesus says this about himself. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. God has life in himself. He does, there isn't a source of life outside of God that God draws from so that he can have some life. Um, the same is true for God the Son. There isn't a source of life outside of God that the Son has to draw on in order to have life. The Father, by begetting a Son, has begotten a Son with the same nature as him who just has life in himself. Utterly independent, utterly without need, utterly without lack, just an infinite ocean, an infinite fountain of life. And so in Acts 17, when uh, Paul is comparing God, the true God, to the, 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 the Greek and Roman gods that he finds in Athens. He says this, uh, Acts 17 verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands um, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. God is not served by you or by me because he needs anything. He has no needs at all. Now that might sound a slightly austere thing to say. Oh, God doesn't need me. That, that's quite disappointing. In one sense, it is absolutely true to say that each one of us is supremely irrelevant to the life of God. Brackets, I'm not saying he doesn't love us and pay attention to us, but... He doesn't need us. Isn't that a burden lifted off your shoulders? God is not a weak and needy God. He has everything he needs in himself and from himself eternally. And so next slide. Here's a a quotation from a philosopher called Robert Sokolovsky. God plus the world cannot be conceived as better than God alone. Let's just think about that for a moment. Over here, you have God alone. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No creation, nothing else existing. Over here, you have God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, plus the world. Which is better? Which has more life, beauty, goodness, perfection, God on his own, Or God plus the world. Now, intuitively, I think we think, oh, well, it must be God plus the world because you've just added something. And if we're thinking of something within creation, something finite, a creature like us, then of course, you know, here is the biggest chocolate cake in the world. Here is the biggest chocolate cake in the world and a bar of lint. 90% chocolate. Which is better? Well, I know which I'm going for every time. I want as much chocolate as I can possibly get, and I will eat the biggest chocolate cake in the world and still want the chocolate bar. That's better. We can't think of God in that kind of additive way because he doesn't exist as just like the biggest thing within creation. One of the things we have to absolutely break down in our imaginations is the idea that somehow God is within the same order of being as us. He's within creation and he's just bigger and better. 
He's more wise than I am. He's stronger than I am. But he's basically on the same scale of being. So, you know, you have kind of ant, antelope, human, God. No, it's not like that at all. You have ant, antelope, human. And then you have a God who is infinitely outside of that. If you add something to infinity... And any, any mathematicians go, what? God plus the world cannot be conceived as better than God alone. That is, no perfection would be lost if God had not created the world. Do you believe that? The world and God must be so understood that nothing but God could be all that there is and there would be no diminution of greatness or goodness or perfection God is not better or greater because of creation, nor is there more goodness or greatness because God did create. When I teach doctrine of God stuff, I say my aim at the end of this class is that you know less than you did when you walked in. <laughs> Can we have the next slide? It's a quotation from um, the one and only St. John of Webster. I think this, is, this, is where, this is where this bites home in wonderful ways. God is perfect blessedness in himself in the absence of creatures. God could not be more happy than he has always been. Therefore, the triune God could be without the world no perfection of God would be lost, no triune bliss compromised were the world not to exist. No enhancement of God is achieved by the world's existence. We don't make God better. Brilliantly, we don't make God worse. We don't make God unhappy. We don't ruin his life. I'm perfectly capable of ruining another human being's life. I pray, pray to God that I don't, but I know I'm capable of doing that. I can't do that with God. And that means he is just free to be good to me. We're going to keep coming back to this idea in a minute. But I want to contrast God with us now. Because as creatures, we depend utterly on God for existence and life. It would be perfectly absurd, wouldn't it, to say, I am perfect blessedness in myself in the absence of everyone else and everything else in all the world. If you could imagine your own existence just in this blank, grey nothingness and go, well, I have all the resources I need to be perfectly happy. As creatures created from nothing, we depend utterly on God for existence and life. So. God isn't served by us. God isn't fed by us. God doesn't live in temples, says Paul. But, uh, verse 28, in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Where do you live? If the fish, his natural environment is to live in the water, what's our natural environment? I mean, this is boggling as well, isn't it? What is my natural environment? God. In him. He is the ocean of life and goodness and perfection. And he's the ocean that we swim in as creatures. From him and through him and to him are all things. Here are some implications. Weakness and dependency are natural and inevitable to human life. And I look around the room and there are some people in that kind of weird age bracket that you don't necessarily think that that's true. You might think that that's true, but it's plausible to think that's not true, that you are weak and dependent. Because you've sort of grown up from being a baby and a toddler when you were weak and dependent on mummy and daddy or whoever your carers were. And then I look around the room... And I'm not going to draw attention to anyone, but, you know, there are those of us who are now very much more aware. <laughs> oh, I'm increasingly weak and sometimes frighteningly dependent on other people. 
And, and what I see in the trajectory of my own life in this world is the walls of my existence starting to close in. And, and what awaits me, and for some of us, it will happen shockingly suddenly. And for others of us, it will happen in a, an agonizingly protracted decades long, weakening and weakening and more dependent and more dependent. And you are at that moment learning what it means to be a creature and the kind of creature God has made. Weakness is not a bug, it's a feature. Because we were created from nothing, we are dust. So weakness and dependency are natural and inevitable and we need, that mean, we need one another. That's how God has set up the world, isn't it? We need one another. And we need the rest of creation. So, you know, Gen we're not going to go there, but Genesis 2. How does Adam live? Well, he's been given these trees bearing fruit. And if he turns up his nose at the trees bearing fruit, he's not going to live for very long. Imagine yourself in that sort of grey nothingness stretching out forever with no water. with no source of food, with no atmosphere, how long will you live? We're dependent on the rest of creation, we're dependent on each other, we're dependent on the animals, but above all, we're dependent on God. In him, we live and move and have our being. And so the water refreshes us because God uses the water to refresh us. The animals feed us because God miraculously turns dead flesh into life for us in our bodies through the chemical processes. Your heart is beating right now. Your lungs are drawing in breath. Your synapses, I hope, are firing if you're still awake. Probably if you're asleep, they're still firing, aren't they? But I mean, just in a different way. Because God is at work. We depend on God for absolutely everything because he is the creator and we are creatures. And just very briefly, that means prayer is utterly basic to human flourishing. Prayer is not just a religious optional extra. Prayer is the means by which we recognize that all of life is gift and come to the good giver and say, please, can I have more of it? Please, will you give more of it to my friend over here? Please, will you, you know... And so, so prayer is just the most rational thing you will ever do. The, prayer, the person who doesn't pray is a complete wally. I mean, in, in him we live and move and have our being. And he said, would you ask me for things, please, and I'll give them to you. Because I have everything. And we go, oh, I don't think I need to pray today. It's just, oh, it's crackers. We are so mad. Anyway, I, I, could, I could rant on that for ages, but I won't. Let's just stop for a moment, because I've been going now for a while. Any thoughts or questions um, before we move on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, pre-fall it was still the case. So uh, pre-fall we would not have grown old and died and decayed, but why would that have happened? Why would we have continued to live? Because God would have continued to sustain our lives. And we would have lived in glad dependence on him coming to the source of our life day by day, moment by moment, and receiving good things at his hands. What the fall does is we turn away from the source of life and think, I can live without him. Um, yeah, so that, that. So, and so in heaven, when we have eternal life, why do we have eternal life? Not because God just goes, wave a magic wand, there you are, now you don't need me. 
but because our entire existence will be turned towards him in joyful, thankful praise as he sustains our life in ways we can't begin to imagine. We will still actually be weak and dependent, but that won't be the sort of painful, dilapidated feeling it is now as sinners. So that it's right to talk about a sort of God's displeasure at our sin and disapproval of our sin. We don't mess his life up. You know, he, do you know what? When you are at your worst, what is God doing? He is delighting in his son. He is delighting in himself. And he is actually going, do you know what, Claire? Your life would be much happier if you stopped doing that and if you just turned back to me. This is really bad for you, so stop it. But he's not, he's not, it's not, it's not like in the kind of, you know, whatever it is, dysfunctional friendship. Where you go and have lunch with your friend and just come away and go, oh boy, that was just awful and I just need to go and lie down for a couple of hours. Um. I, I need to go and medicate myself with chocolate cake right now. God doesn't need medicating. It's nice, isn't it, actually, to think at your worst, you, you're never going to drive God to the end of his tether with you. Parents, you know what it's like to be driven to the end of your tether, don't you? Children... <laughs> In relation to your parents, you know what it's like to be driven to the end of your tether. That's not God's experience at all. And so we have to say, yeah, he does mind our sin. He does have standards. He does punish sin, unrepented sin, but not because it sort of wears him out and makes him unhappy. So let me just repeat the question for the... Even before the fall, there was a fall, the devil. He's the culprit. We just happened to fall for it. I'm going to go with you part of the way on that and say, before the fall, there was a devil. Before the fall, but before the devil, the devil was a good angel. He was created good, and he wanted to live in independence from God. And so he fell. He was puffed up by his pride, thinking to ascend to heaven, and so the fitting thing is that he falls. And then he comes into the garden and tempts Eve and through Eve, Adam. Or, to be honest, tempts Eve and Adam is standing right there with her, as the text makes clear, and he's just a passive, pathetic waste of space at that moment. Um, but he, Satan, we, we can't say Satan was the culprit and we weren't because we did what we wanted to do, which was to be like Satan rather than like God, um, to actually set ourselves over against God. So what happens in Genesis 3? I, 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 as I was hoping Ephraim would do the bad joke last night and he didn't, so I'm going to do it now. You know, God comes and he has the conversation and Adam blames, Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> boom, boom. That's how we function, isn't it? And God's not having a word of it. No. Do you know what? Where's the curse going to land? It's going to land on the woman. On the serpent, yes. But on the woman and on the man. So we are absolutely culpable and to blame. We could have we resisted the, sa the Satan, but we didn't. One more question, then we'll move on. Yeah.
Yeah, the, the question is, um, I think, um, uh, passage in Hosea, um, you think about Genesis 6 as well, we, we hear about God's sort of like sorrow, grief, regret um, in terms of human sin, uh, you know, and we don't need to be afraid of that, um, but he's not consumed by it, is that, is that what, roughly what you were saying? The way, we, the way we think about how language applies to God is probably a bigger thing than I can get into now. And I may, you know, I, I risk digging myself a deep hole. When we say God has an arm, are we to think God has an arm? Literally. No. Because he's a spirit. So what, is, what does the Bible mean when it says God has an arm? It means he's powerful. Strong right arm. When I think... God is powerful, am I to think, therefore, he does some things that are really quite difficult for him, but because he's so big and strong, he can do them? No. What we think of as the biggest, most difficult, most demanding thing in the world is just effortless for God, because he's God. And I think we then need to begin to apply that to when God says he regrets something, what does he mean? Does he think, oh, is he up in heaven going, oh, I just made a mistake there. Bother. Rats. <sighs> got to try and somehow, you know, like the bad chess player. Oh, no, I've just, I'm going to pretend that I meant to sacrifice that bishop. No. That bishop was not a... <laughs> rook. For the, for the tape, rook. Um, <coughs> and, and yet, God loathes sin. Because he is of purer eyes than to look on evil. We can absolutely say that. It doesn't wound him and make him feel miserable. But it's just, what, what, what has light got to do with darkness? What has purity got to do with filth? Um, God, God hates sin in the same way that Persil hates dirt on your clothes. Um, just, let's get rid of it. We need to move on. As creatures, we're good. Um, th th we're now getting to the good stuff, and I've taken far too long over the... I hope it was an okay stuff. But So you get repeatedly in Genesis 1, seven times, it was good. God, God saw the light that it was good. Um, verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. It was good. It was good. It was good. It was good. And then you get to day, day 6 and the creation of humans... And God saw all that he has made, and behold, it was flipping marvellous. And we're left going, how can that be? How can creation be so good? I am currently obsessed with um, a piece of music that is just blowing my mind. I've got it on repeat all the time. Um, and one of the things that it's led me to do is to go, oh, do you know, I want to find out more about this composer. Um, and I want to find all of the music that he's written because it's so great. But I want to know about him as well. Why is creation so good? Because the creator is so good. We will never understand um, the goodness of creation if we don't know the goodness of the creator. Because the good things in creation, first and foremost, what are they? They are from him and through him and to him. They're signposts. They have their existence from him and they're signposts to him. And so Jesus says this mind-blowing thing in Mark 10 when the rich young ruler comes to him and, and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And we're supposed to reflect on this and go, no, no, hang on, Jesus is good, isn't he? What does that tell us about Jesus? If no one is good except God alone and Jesus is good, okay. But you set that, you set that alongside Genesis 1. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then God comes into his world and goes, nothing's good apart from me. In comparison, there is nothing that is good apart from me. 
So the Puritan Thomas Charnock says this, uh, God only is infinitely good, a boundless goodness that knows no limits, a goodness as infinite as his essence, not only good, but best, not only good, but goodness itself, the supreme, unconceivable goodness. All things else are but little particles of God, small sparks from this immense flame, sips of goodness to this fountain. So to call God good is not to put him alongside good things in creation and to say he's just the biggest and best good thing in a series of goods. There's not this thing called the good that's like a giant pie and God has the, the massive portion of it and then we all just get tiny little slivers. Compared to God, nothing and no one is good, only God alone. Because he is good in and of himself. He is good by his own goodness and he is an infinite ocean of goodness. And I would love to linger on this, but we can't. But because God is good, that inevitably means that if he decides to act, what he does is going to be good. Psalm 119 verse 68, you are good and you do good. So because God is good, what he does is good. And therefore the product of those acts is good. And therefore creation is good. Here's a 17th century theologian, Petrus van Maastricht. From the infinite and unchanging stores of his goodness, God distributes his goodness bit by bit to everything he makes. So rocks, rivers, mountains, lakes, bluebells, beech trees, dandelions, dragonflies, fields, forests, Kestrels, kingfishers, lions, leprechauns. That's just to see if you're awake. <laughs> Gerard Manley Hopkins, the poet, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And yet we can say that all of the goodness in the world isn't even a drop in a bucket compared to the infinite goodness of God. Creation is good. And humans are very good. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. This sort of drumbeat going through the chapter. And then all of a sudden there's this change in the rhythm. Let us make man in our image. After our likeness, so God creates man, male and female, in the image of God, and then goes, it is very good. One creature surpasses all the others. Everything else in creation reveals traces, vestiges of God's goodness. One creature reveals God's image. So I live in Salisbury. Um, and we have a cathedral, beloved of Russian spies who've come to our city to poison people. And it's an extraordinary building. It's unusual um, among cathedrals because, you know, you go into most cathedrals and they're built over centuries and, and there are all kinds of little side chapels and it's a sort of twisty turny and you can never quite get a sense of how does this whole thing fit together when you're standing in the middle of it. Salisbury's not like that. It, it's all built in one big piece and has an integrity so that you're standing in the nave, the sort of long middle bit, and you can really get a sense, or you can see the whole cathedral from one end to the other. It's an absolutely magnificent um, example of early Gothic architecture, or so I've been told. Um, it's very tall, very narrow. It's got beautiful dark Purbeck marble pillars, lovely stained glass, and this incredible sort of vaulting roof. And in the middle of the nave, you have this extraordinary font. Now, I'm an architectural snob, as it happens. I, I, as in all things, I'm a snob, but, um, well, all things artistic. Um, 
I, and so I tend to go into cathedrals and go, do you know what? The medievals really knew how to do stuff, and then their modern con- sort of counterparts come along and ruin things. But in Salisbury, there is this beautiful font made in 2008 by a sculptor called William Pye. It's, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, and it's sort of in the shape of a dove and a cross, uh, and it's got this sort of glass-like surface. So glass-like that I've seen an American tourist put a handbag on the font thinking it was glass. <laughs> but the point is you can stand at the edge of the font and you can look up and see the grandeur of the architecture of the cathedral. Or you can look across the surface of the font and you can see the stained glass and the pillars and the roof uh, and the nave reflected in this very shallow water. That reflection is what it means for us humans to be made in the image of God. So what is it when you, that happens when you encounter another human being? No matter how old or young, impressive or unimpressive, capable or incapable, strong or weak, brilliant or dull, dull? Dull people are only dull because our eyes are dull. They're extraordinary because they reflect the image of the infinite, eternal, good God. God the creator gives life, says John Webster. And the gift of life includes the bestowal of inalienable and inviolable dignity. That's not how our world sees it, is it? Um, the ground of human dignity is the fact that we reflect the image of God because he made us to do that. What happens if you remove God from the picture? What would happen if you stood by the font in Salisbury Cathedral without Salisbury Cathedral there and you looked across the surface? You see a pool of shallow water. The beauty and the dignity gone. Immanuel Kant, writing at the beginning of the Enlightenment, says this, autonomy... Being your own ruler is the ground of the dignity of human nature. But if we're autonomous, if God is out of the picture, what are we reflecting? Everything is just a shallow surface. Now, I'm sorry, we have to skip over the next bits. But I want to get to the implications. Three implications really quickly. First of all, we don't get to decide which lives have dignity. God has already decided that. How has he decided it? By creating them. By creating them in his image, after his likeness, to reflect his glory in the world. And if we cannot see it, we are incredibly impoverished. And the reason we cannot see it is because we don't want to see God. He's boring to us or frightening to us. And so we miss the glory of his creatures. We don't get to decide which lives have dignity. It's not up to us. It's, human dignity is something we recognize, not something we confer. The second thing, all human life is good. So it seems to me the basic posture towards myself... And the basic posture towards other people is this. It is good that you exist. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, I just want to press this on you this morning. It is good that you exist. I am so glad you're here. What's the difference in the value of two babies in a womb, one of whom is loved and cherished by her parents, and one of whom has parents who wish that she didn't exist? What's the difference in value? Is it, is it the parent's choice? No, there is no difference. And so the correct posture, whatever the circumstances of the conception is, it is good that you exist. 
no matter how difficult or challenging your life is, it is good that you exist. Doctors do not get to decide how valuable a human life is. Lawmakers do not get to decide how valuable a human life is. Parents do not get to decide how valuable a human life is. Children, spouses, caregivers do not get to decide how valuable a human life is because God has created this life and says it is good. I don't even get to decide for myself how valuable my life is. And then the last thing to see is, why is it good? Because the shape and meaning of human life is this, from him and through him and to him. Can we go to the last slide? I just want to end with these two quotes from, I don't know if you're allowed to quote Karl Barth at the Keswick Convention, but I'm going to anyway. I've quoted Thomas Aquinas, so, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. I think this first quote is mind-boggling. Here is the God who has no need of any of us. Here is the God who is infinitely, unchangingly happy, an unbounded ocean of life and goodness and happiness and delight. And it turns out, because he's so good, that his goodness is not self-absorbed and self-revolving and turned in on himself. He's so good that he turns outwards to us. Why? Not because he needs us, but nevertheless because he wants us for himself. Okay, I just want to say, just pause, think about yourself. God wants you for himself. Before the world was created, God the Father said to God the Son, Hey, I've got a really good gift for you. Before the foundation of the world, God loved the idea of you. Of you with all your quirks and idiosyncrasies and things you don't like about yourself and and in all the mess and the muddle of your sin and weakness and failure, God loved the idea of you. And he loved the idea of you so much that he loved you into existence for himself. And so last quote, God calls us to himself as a father, his child. I don't know what image that conjures up for you. There are ways in which some of us will have experienced a father or a mother calling us to him or herself. And it's been a frightening and awful thing. God is not like that. He is infinitely good. He is the very best of fathers. What was he doing when he sent his son into the world? He was calling you to himself. What was he doing when he poured his spirit out upon you and gave you new birth? He was calling you to himself. What's he been doing in the last hour that we've been together? He's been calling you to himself. When we go into the tent in a moment and we hear Sam preach from God's word, God will be calling you to himself. It's good that you exist and God wants you for himself. Let's pray. Father, we are uh, just awed that a perfect God like you, with no needs at all, would want us. We praise you for the gift of life, for the dignity of bearing your image, and for the fact that in the Lord Jesus you have called us. Give us ears to hear your voice and to delight to run to you. In Jesus' name, amen.